It always makes me feel a little bit vulnerable to open up for questions. The self-doubt sets in and I find myself wondering if anyone will even ask any. But it turns out I needn't have worried. Once again, so many of you were kind enough to submit questions and I received far more than I was expecting, so thanks so much to those of you who did. As with last time, I'm going to answer 10 of my favourites over the course of two videos. I hope you enjoy it. I received quite a few variations on, on this particular question and it's something I've been asked a lot about since I started the channel. And I've shied away from answering it in the past, largely because on this channel, I never aim to speak from a position of authority. And also because I've never considered the goals of the channel to be instructive or educational, but rather reflective. But since it seems to be of interest, I'll do my best to offer my own take on it. There are so many things I could say in response that are just as fundamental to being a good reader, both technical and commonsensical, but which you can easily find elsewhere. So instead, I'm going to talk about a few ideas that hum like distant radio static behind my own approach to reading. I remember when I was younger, feeling enormous fear about approaching challenging texts, a constant nagging worry about whether I was getting it or not, whatever getting it might mean. But gradually I've come to think of this feeling of uncertainty as central to the reading experience, as something not to be rejected, but embraced. I say this for a number of reasons. Firstly, there's nothing wrong with confusion or obscurity. Personally, I enjoy the sensation that certain aspects of a text elude me or perhaps disorientate me. It's worth remembering that this is a potential property of language. Why should it not be exploited? Moreover, a multiplicity of meanings is a positive thing for me. Allowing meanings to coexist is not to render a text senseless, but to enrich it infinitely. I grow more and more comfortable with this, especially being a teacher, which requires me to return to texts over and over again. It's rare that a given text emerges in the same condition when a group of young minds has been trained upon it. And secondly, I think that Looking for intentionality in literary works is perhaps the very thing we can be absolutely sure of not finding. To say with absolute certainty what an author meant might even be an impossibility. And this grows more and more uncertain the further the author, the work, and its reading public recedes from us in time. Consider, for instance, the degree to which your own modes of interpretation shift over the course of your lifetime, or even over a few years. Or think about how the culture around you and public discourse shapes your mind and causes you to be alert to certain questions above others. Consider how much cultural baggage you bring to the act of interpretation. Your age, nationality, gender, educational background, preoccupations, etc. In my view, we are already at an infinite cultural distance from the reading public of, say, Richard Yeats, to say nothing of Shakespeare, the Pearl Poet, or Homer. Of course, there is some consistency to the concerns of humanity over time, and we're still obsessed with many of the same things that our ancestors were. And this is also not to say that we can't educate ourselves into a more complete understanding or appreciation of the time and circumstances of a given author. But we can't inhabit those things any more than we can inhabit the mind of another, though, incidentally, reading might be the closest we can get to such a condition. But the art of the past is changed irrevocably by the intervening years between you and it and by the art and culture that comprises those years. Homer was not the same after James Joyce. 
To my mind, there's nothing wrong with this. I think it can be invigorating and exciting to observe that every text, in a kind of volatile chemical reaction with the reader's mind, acquires new properties with each reading. This is perhaps the most obvious point I'll consider here, but it seems to me that there's no escaping the idea of noticing as being crucial to good reading. And what I mean by it, I suppose, has a lot to do, though not everything, with a, a formalist approach to literature. David Cowles calls formalism the first language of every student of literature. And while some may regard it as ultimately reductive, I still think there's a lot to be gained from assuming that an attentive, close reading of a given text, and an attempt to gain a detailed understanding of its language and structure, will bear fruit. For me, this isn't to say that every possible meaning of a text is intrinsic to it, simply that it's a positive thing to be open to the linguistic and formal nuances of a work of literature, which, after all, is a linguistic artefact. Of course, the more one has read and studied, and the more comfortable with naming and identifying technical and formal or even rhythmic features of a text one becomes, the easier this will be. I'll add that some comfort with the identification of literary form and technique allows one to think about these things in an historically resonant sense. Recognizing a poetic form, for instance, might allow a reader to place a given work in a lineage of preceding instances of the form, and able then to hear the reverberations that echo forward from them apprehending meaning from the extent of historical dissonances and harmonies. However magnificent an individual book might be, it can't resonate as profoundly without something to reflect its frequencies. If the book is the organ then the entirety of literature is the cathedral. It is the walls and vaulted ceiling that sends the book's vibrations back to itself on the airwaves. This, in my estimation, is the greatest reason to read well, to read intensely and broadly, not to cultivate some abstract erudition or to gain some tangible knowledge. But because of the enrichment that doing so offers to the reading experience itself, one of my very favorite ways to read and to talk about literature, and this is as true of my studies at university as it is of what I try to do on this channel, is by tracing allusions and echoes between literary works. When allusion is used effectively, it has the power to excavate basements, to dig vast networks of tunnels below the many houses of fiction. Being alert to illusion can allow the reader to travel these tunnels and trace subtle connections that are invisible from the floors above ground. Finally, I want to say that I rarely think of reading as an intellectual activity. For me, the idea of being clever or feeling clever has nothing at all to do with the act of reading. The intellect is engaged, perhaps, when one tries to build arguments about a text in an act of criticism. But I think of this faculty as a limiting one which foregrounds the utility of a text. When reading, I try not to ask what can this tell me, or what is the purpose of this? Those are questions I might ask of the operating manual of a washing machine. Instead, I prefer to open myself to a book's linguistic and emotional landscape, to feel and trace deliberately, though not schematically, whatever it stirs in me, to lift the book like a seashell to my ear and listen for its thrum of cresting waves and rain. 
and imbibe its wind-blown chorus. I say this not to be poetic, but to express the idea that, in my own case, reading is about being open to atmospheric states and allowing oneself to welcome associative impressions while honouring the matter and manner of the text. If we're dealing with a particularly special book, its language must be learned emotionally, not by submitting the book to an X-ray that exposes its skeleton, obscuring in the process its life and flesh. Firstly, I have to acknowledge an enormous debt to Cliff from Better Than Food. I'm sure I owe a huge portion of my subscribers directly to him. When Sherd's Tube was first starting, he gave me a big shout out and I'm really grateful for that. Not least because he's a sensitive reader and is also someone who seems to share a lot of my tastes and sensibilities as well as my goal of calling attention to lesser known writers. I also have to mention two prolific beasts of booktube, Chris from Leaf by Leaf and Sean from Travel Through Stories, who both astonish me with the quality and regularity of their output. I honestly have no idea how they do it. I've discussed this with Seth from Waste Mailing List, uh, another great booktuber, by the way, and we're at a complete loss to explain it and remain in awe. Life seems to get in the way so often that I regularly fall behind on my own modest goal of one video per month. And these guys are reviewing 900-page novels every week. At the moment, they both seem to be taking a well-earned break, and I say good for them. I have both of them to thank for huge portions of my ever-expanding library. Echo from Echoes of Lost Libraries appears to be in possession of one of the most fascinating personal libraries. I really appreciate his taste and he constantly introduces me to new and intriguing writers. And there's also a calm, unhurried pace to his videos that really appeals to me. Paperbird has to be one of the most inventive reviewers on here. He's so formally innovative and simultaneously unpretentious, which is a combination I admire endlessly. I've also recently enjoyed watching Reading with Miles, who has very interesting and eclectic taste. Their channel has an emphasis, though not an exclusive emphasis on folklore and horror, which I appreciate very much. In all honesty though, I don't watch an enormous amount of booktube. When I'm watching YouTube, it's usually videos about music or music theory, languages and linguistics. My favorite YouTuber is probably Ben Levin, who from my perspective is constantly expanding the possibilities of the form it's just extraordinary to watch him grow as an artist. There are a number of books I turn to in moments of difficulty, or especially when I've hit a bit of a reading slump. And I find that turning to something deeply familiar can reinvigorate me as a reader and take me back to that incipient stage of my reading life when the flowers of literature were unfurling before me. Of course, this means that the books I return to are often ones I encountered very early in life. I think there's something delicious about growing with a book, allowing it to be the protean thing that it is, which speaks to you in different ways at different stages of life. There are a number of books I could have chosen in response to this question, books that I've read more often than any others. For instance, I almost picked Mary Shelley's Frankenstein because, well, some books are better than others, and I consider the first hundred pages or so of that novel to be pretty much unparalleled in English fiction. I almost chose Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, which, even after having read it, 
eight or nine times still retains a profound sense of obscurity for me, as if there's some extra ingredient beyond the prose that radiates with endless mystery. But instead, I'm going to pick Gene Wolfe's The Book of the New Sun. It might seem strange that I'd pick this one given that I've only read the whole of the Tetralogy once, but I have quite specific reasons for doing so. I've read the first two volumes, The Shadow of the Torturer and The Claw of the Conciliator, more times than I can remember. I think of them as the books that introduced me to the idea of ambitious, challenging fiction. Indeed, the fact that I found them challenging when I encountered them first as a teenager is part of why I've read them so many times. At the time, I'd been reading a lot of science fiction and fantasy books and obsessively devouring the Galant's Masterworks series. And Gene Wolfe's book was one that stopped me completely in my tracks. On the one hand, it seemed to share so much with the genre that I'd become accustomed to. It had something approximating a quest narrative. It had swords, giants, what appeared to be magic. It had a journey across a wild and unfamiliar landscape. And yet, stylistically and conceptually, and in lots of other ways, it was so unlike anything else I'd read. Here was a book that pushed against its readers' expectations, denied them clarity and answers that played narrative games. Here was a book that wanted to misdirect me, confuse me, and to make me work in order to understand. From this book, I learned how rewarding these things could be. So I want to talk about some of the things that make this book so special, in my opinion. First of all, I consider it to be a masterclass in defamiliarization and this is central to its world building. It's set on our own Earth, in the inconceivably distant future, in a time when the sun is dying and our planet's volcanic activity has ceased. It's a world containing the vestiges of a high technology which remains shrouded in myth and ill understood, such that a painting of an armored figure standing on a desolate landscape bearing a strange, stiff banner with a visor entirely of gold, is seen on close reading to be an ancient photograph of the moon landing. This is just one mild example of countless revelations of its kind woven into the fabric of the text. I would also argue that Gene Wolfe's techniques enact a kind of defamiliarization on a generic and metatextual level, imbuing the familiar genre of fantasy and science fiction with a new and alien magic. A fantasy world's nomenclature can make or break the spell an author attempts to cast over the reader. Wolf's logophilic spell is utterly mesmerizing. Rather than inventing terms, he makes use of existing archaic words, usually Latinate or Hellenic in origin, whose meanings are suggestive rather than direct. This throws a veil of inscrutability over the text and conveys the great age of the book's world. One senses depth and history in this language, the transformative erosion and accretion of eons. Fascinatingly, the book places hermeneutics at its core. It asks to be interpreted and reinterpreted and consistently challenges straightforward or singular readings. This is not only evident in the dense, obscuring layers of history within the world and its arcane rituals, but in the interpretive acts of the narrator himself, of his own past and character, of his growing epistemological concerns, of the tales he is told, the legends and stories he reads in the brown book that he carries with him throughout his adventure. On my earliest readings of the book, I was surely only very distantly aware of these complexities. But the point is that 
It was the many failed attempts to read the book that finally allowed me to acquire the tools I needed in order to finish it. Not only has the book been a comfort to me, but it's also given me a kind of invaluable confidence in encountering new and strange kinds of literature and the strength not to feel frightened when I do. This is something that I've battled with over the years and I've experimented with lots of different things. I've taken extensive marginal notes or simply noted down the illusions I observe. I've kept separate notebooks alongside my reading or reflected on my reading in, in diaries. And I haven't yet arrived at something that's been consistent in my reading life. I have a few books that are very heavily annotated and these are usually books that I've either taught or become obsessed by at various points in my life. I've enjoyed keeping reading notebooks and there is something really satisfying about keeping a record of one's developing thoughts or in attempting to gain a comprehensive structural view of a longer text. A few years ago, while I was reading Bolaño's 2666 for the second time, I kept more elaborate reflective notes and sketches, which I did find rewarding, but at which I failed to be consistent. These days, the times when I take lots of notes are usually limited to when I'm reading towards a given purpose, perhaps a video essay or teaching a class. This is when I'll be a little more rigorous. But for my own private reading, at least for now, I've tried not to worry myself too much about being methodical. And there are reasons for this too. I think my more relaxed approach to note-taking has come about because of reflections on the purpose of doing it in the first place. I think that my own impulse to take notes came from a desire to, as it were, swallow a given book whole, to take possession of its entirety and to hold its complex architecture in my mind. In my own experiments with note-taking, this is probably what I was attempting to do. Ultimately, I've come to the conclusion that this is not how my reading mind functions and maybe my experiments in note-taking were antithetical to my own impressionistic mode of reading. I'm not a precise schematic thinker and I've grown to be comfortable with that. My own approach to literary thinking is far more non-linear. It has more to do with mood and resonance, with tracing links between obscurely connected ideas forging ambient alignments that bloom like halos from indeterminate points of focus. This isn't to say that such impressions can't be articulated, but perhaps that their origin is not always linguistic. And besides these more arcane considerations, it's also true to say that I very rarely return to notes once they've been made and that perhaps this is a good enough reason not to get too stressed about it. This is an enormous question and there are so many writers I could talk about, so I'll try to limit it to a few who have been really important to me. I've already mentioned Mary Shelley, who holds a very dear place both in my heart and on my bookshelves. But to turn to another romantic or pre-romantic author, I should mention Anna Letitia Barbold, whose work I first encountered when I was studying Romanticism on my master's degree. She's a writer who comes out of the infinitely rich, parallel intellectual tradition of English dissenters in the 18th century that I admire so much. Barbold was a radical, a passionate abolitionist and an educator. In addition to her political poetry, she composed 
work that anticipated the imaginative and philosophical reveries in the nature poetry of Wordsworth and Coleridge. Her poem, A Summer Evening's Meditation from 1773, is a hymn to the transcendent power of imagination. In it, she recounts a mental journey from the green borders of the peopled earth to the edges of the universe, sailing upward on the wings of fancy into the trackless deeps of space. For some, its language might be all too ornate and steeped in the conventions of its period, but for me what transcends this is the wildness of its imaginative act, whose cosmic grandeur I would generally associate with much later periods of literature. I should also mention the supernatural tales of Vernon Lee, whose work we covered on episode 20 of Sherd's podcast. I consider her collection of 1890, Hauntings, to be one of the finest examples of supernatural tales in English. Her ghost stories are distinguished by their stylistic elegance and an erudition that anticipates the scholarly or antiquarian ghost stories that M.R. James would later become famous for. Unlike James, however, Lee's work is also characterized by a sensuous and aesthetically charged imagination. She often places art at the center of her narratives and explores the boundaries between aesthetic experiences and experiences of the supernatural, as in the masterful tale, A Wicked Voice, in which a Wagnerian composer living in Venice is haunted by the voice of a castrato from the preceding century. Penelope Fitzgerald too, and particularly her novel The Blue Flower has been very important to me. Fitzgerald has a delicacy of touch as a writer that floods with light the 18th century world she writes about in that novel. There is also a kind of subtle lyricism in her work that I find very moving, as well as an attentive eye for tragedies with a lowercase t. In order not to try anyone's patience, I'll quickly run through a number of women writers whose work I admire enormously. I'm enamored with Virginia Woolf, whose work I'd like to explore in its entirety throughout my reading life. Mary Butts added to modernism a distinct and deliciously mystical flavor. Anna Kavan's Ice was one of the most compelling books we ever read for the podcast. Toni Morrison's beloved shook me to my bones and I'm determined to read everything else she published. Ursula K. Le Guin's novels broke open endless new vistas of imagination for me. In the last few years I've read George Eliot's Adam Bede and Middlemarch, whose attention to the most subtle momentary alterations of mood in her characters is astonishing. I could, of course, go on, but I'll stop there for now. I should also say here that I regard it as one of my great failings as a reader that the bulk of my reading is still overwhelmingly comprised of male writers. If you have any recommendations that you'd like me to check out, please let me know in the comments and I'll gladly expand my to-be-read pile. I have a few of my own plans. One writer I've not yet read, but I'm very excited to explore is Sylvia Townsend Warner. I recently picked up a lot of her books and I'm eager to get to them very soon. I'm also really intrigued by Anne Quinn, Clarice Lispector, and Christine Brooke Rose, to name just a few. Thanks again to everyone who submitted a question. I'll be back soon with part four of the Q&A. If I didn't answer your question, Try to consider it a mercy that the video is not twice the length. If you enjoyed watching, please consider subscribing to the channel or sharing it somewhere online. Uh, it really helps me out and I truly appreciate it when, when you do that. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.